Keith, I wanted to say with you first, you have a personal tie to this organization up until you were 17. At what point did you realize you wanted to make this documentary and how did this partnership with Luke come about? Um, yeah, no, this is how it all how it all started. I mean, obviously, I grew up in in this. So this was my personal experience. And, you know, I had been living with it my whole life. But, you know, there was just so much I didn't know about it and didn't really understand um, about my own, you know, reality of my own experience, the world I lived inside of, you know, so I when the group fell apart in 1991, I left New York, I went to college, um, I stayed away for a long time. And everybody from the group kind of scattered, um, somebody described it as a diaspora, it was like everybody sort of, you know, fled in certain ways, rebuilt their lives, but did it mm. basically in hiding, you know, there was all the publicity from the 80s really scarred people about any exposure. And my family was the same. And I totally internalized that. I talked about it with friends, you know, and, and people I was close to, but I, I wanted no, you know, public association with it. It wasn't until I returned to New York about a decade later and I um, got re remet some of the other kids from the group. We'd all sort of lost touch and we started sharing our stories and realized we all had a lot of the same questions about the past. And there were so many things we didn't know each about, you know, each other's lives and experiences, mm -hmm. why certain things were the way they were. Um, people had questions about their paternity, which is something that comes up in, in this episode. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, there was uh, just a lot of cross currents of that sort of thing. And, and so that, that sort of idea of wanting to explore this, to investigate it was just building for me. Um, and then uh, I was sort of doing some writing about it and always feeling like I, was blocked about what the story actually was, um, you know, and so then uh, at a certain point, you know, I, you know, just made the choice that, uh, okay, I can't move forward in my life until I really do and in investigate this, understand what it was. And that would involve going back to the people that I had once lived among, many of them who had ra helped to raise me since this was a communal parenting situation, yeah. you know, communal families, communal child rearing. Um, so, you know, these are people I've been very close to, but I, I didn't understand what their experience had been. You know, I didn't know why they were in the group, how they got involved and what happened to them afterwards. So it just, you know, um, even though documentary filmmaking wasn't, you know, my my background at that point, um, I felt like my experience as a writer um, would, I could bring that skills and that and, and that background to a pro this project, but it had to be done this way. And I knew it was such a visual story. Yeah. The visual storytelling, you know, opportunities were so, you know, extraordinary with the theater and the documentary films that the group made, which don't really appear in this episode, but come into play later and all the media publicity. So I just, and all the, the photo archives. So I just knew this is the, the form it had to take. And so Luke and I were actually acquaintances um, we, you know, had some mutual friends and, um, we actually saw a screening together of a documentary. And I started telling him right afterwards about this, that I had this idea for this project and I'll let him take over, um, because it was really that, you know, moment and our collaboration, um, mm. you know, I, it, this, this, this idea that I'd had, and then all of his, you know, experience and background as a filmmaker and, and, and his own interest in the subject matter. And it was really that, um, you know, that, that combination that sort of was the seed of everything we did after. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I grew up um, in part of my, my childhood in a, in a guru led meditation ashram and, um, and left it when I was a teenager. And, it's always been something like a, a subject matter that I wanted to kind of get back into about groups and 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 like turning over our, uh, control of your life to to people. Um, and so I hadn't found a story that that kind of worked in a way that would satisfy what I was looking for until Keith brought this to me. Mm. Uh, and I think, I mean, there's a lot about the story that's just completely fascinating. But I think a big part of what really spoke to me in particular about this was how um how this group if you looked at them you wouldn't be able to tell they were any different from your average new yorker at the time um and that 
that really gave access to this one side of these fringe groups, these occult mm-hmm. groups that I wanted to explore. Because most of the time when those stories are told, they're told like a freak show, right? They're told as a, in a sensational way about a group that is, you know, either ideologically or physically or appearance wise far away from normal society. Um, and that's not really what it's about. Like all of us are not that many steps away from joining something like this, if the conditions are right. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I think when most of those sensational versions of cult stories are told, they're told to kind of be, um, to make us feel safer, Mm -hmm. make us look at our own lives and be like, yeah, like things aren't great perhaps, but at least I'm not in a cult, you know? (laughs) (laughs) Um, And really like extreme ways of living are, I mean, I think we've seen it in recent years. Extreme ways of living are just a couple steps away for a lot of people. You know, we've seen it in, in various political extremism. Um, a lot of those people who are in extreme positions now in their lives were not several years ago. You know, it happens quickly and it happens easily. Yeah, great answer. You know, Luke, one of the most exciting things about documentary filmmaking is that there's an unpredictability that you can't account for. And often the narrative begins to unfold during the process. Having spent 10 years working on this series, how has this project evolved over time? Well, when we began this, uh, Keith and I fully saw it as this historical documentary. We 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 saw the history of the fourth wall, the Sullivanians, as this forgotten history that w- our project was going to be to kind of unearth it from the forgotten history of New York mm-hmm. or, or the, you know, the, uh, the general understanding of cults in America. Um, but as we got into it and started to talk to people, it became very clear that even though the group itself ended in the early 90s, the experience and the aftermath and the resonance and everything that kind of was there that carried on for people was still very, very present in, yeah. in the time that we were filming. Um, and so as we got deeper and deeper into that, um, we saw not only was that true for most of the people we were filming with, but it was also very true for Keith. And so the more we filmed, the more it became just totally, totally clear to us that like Keith Keith's investigation, which was part of the mechanism of the documentary, yeah. was really part of the story. And so we brought that that's like the, the the major evolution of this project over time was bringing Keith on screen, bringing mm. him in the story. Um, and I mean, it's in in many ways, it becomes sort of this the center narrative, even though there's yeah. a lot of other stories at play. It's not just Keith's story, but it's the center narrative that really um lets people see what this process of investigation and discovery is as he talks to his mother in various yeah. stages over this. Perfect segue to this next question. But Keith, there's so much vulnerability and trust that's needed for a project like this, especially when you're interviewing an array of different subjects and asking them to recount their experiences with and in this call. And how beneficial was it having those prior relationships with many of the different people that you feature in this docu-series? And how were you able to create the environment where they all felt comfortable sharing their experiences? Yeah, no, that's a it's a great question. I mean, truly, it, it took, you know, some people months, some people years mm. to get comfortable with that. And yeah, absolutely, my, you know, previous you know relationships were were crucial to this. Um, but you know, some of the people I hadn't seen in years, and some of them people didn't even really know me. I was a child, you know, they were adults, so I I had to gain the trust of, you know, a lot a lot of different people, and you know, Luke and I you know, collaborated on that process. And and it, 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 it really did take a while. I mean, I started with the people closest to me, the friends, my age, um, but even, and even them, they, you know, they were a lot, they had a lot of misgivings about their own, you know, need, you know, the, the uh, feelings about going public about the story and that whether I was the right person to tell the story being the the child of the leaders. So mm-hmm. I had a lot of convincing of people that I was, you know, searching for the truth that I was vulnerable myself about this, that I was willing to explore whatever it was that I would find, um, you know, whatever it said about my parents or my family or about the group at large, you know, and I, I had, I had to convince people of that, but you know, that's the process. Uh, but I, I, that's absolutely how, where I was coming from. So, you know, I could, I could convince them in earnest of that. And I think the results, mm you know, are, are seen because that's what it is. And I think my own 
you know, the what the process Luke just described. Um, the process Luke just described of uh, you know, like discovering my own, you know, part in in the story on screen um was also, you know, what changed for me in um basically in, you know, when we started it, I was asking other people to go on camera and be vulnerable. And then I realized that, you know, when we realized I was part of the story, I was like, oh, I'm going to have to do that as well. And I think that really helped people be, be comfortable because I'm asking people to do this thing and, you know, be vulnerable on camera and tell their stories, um, explore these, you know, parts of their life that they maybe tried to forget, or at least haven't wanted to talk about in, in an open way. And now I'm going to have to do that too. And I think when people saw that I was doing that as well, that, you know, really helped, you know, get yeah. people to be like, okay, this is something I can, if Keith is putting himself out there as well, then, you know, and, and I think the truth is a lot of people, you know, the, the, the need to keep all this a secret is a huge burden, you know, I mean, it was protective of people in a lot of ways, you know, and, and I think a lot of people felt like they would never talk about this ever again in public. But I think once the opportunity to tell their story and to make sense of this huge part of their life that they had, you know, been having to keep in hiding for so long, I think that, you know, that that was that was an opportunity for them to really be like, oh, no, I can try to integrate this piece of my life that I've sort of segregated, you know, out mm. as like this uh, aberration in, in my sort of personal, you know, history. But actually, no, this is part of who I am. This is informed who I am. And I, I want to talk about this. And Luke, this is also the first time that Wes Craven has publicly spoken about his involvement with the organization. How did that come about? Totally by chance. Um, one of our cinematographers happened to be at the same place as him uh, and was just talking about this project that he was working on. Mm. And uh, and so Wes Craven was listening and he was like, I, is this the Sullivanians? And <laughs> it, it, he connected it because just by the description. And that led to the interview, which really, you know, we were so fortunate to get it, both because he'd never spoken publicly about yeah. it also because uh, we didn't know it at the time, but it was not too far from the end of his life. Um, and I think it was from from my understanding, from talking um, to him around that time and then to his widow, like it was a very important thing for him to actually have a chance to, to unload this mm. of his history um, somewhere. Uh, so I think that was a very positive thing for him. I know also from talking to him that like this experience, even though it was a small chapter in his life overall, he had a very, you know, many, many chaptered life. Um, it fed into a lot of the themes that he put into his films. Yeah. And, you know, um, and so it's a very, you know, very seminal moment for him. Um, and I'm glad that he got a chance to record that in some way. And, and Keith, like you were saying earlier, there's so much that wasn't shared with you when you were a child growing up in the organization. What's been the most shocking kind of revelation for you as you've made this film? <laughs> oh, boy. Um, you know, I mean, there's things that that are hard to talk about without ha us having shown the whole series. So there, yeah. there are shocking personal revelations about my own family's past that are a little hard to talk about right now before the whole episode's released. But I'd say on the on the sort of larger level, I think the level of psychological pressure that was being exerted on people through the therapy to, you know, just that was directing part every part of their life was, you know, that that was the most shocking. I, I just didn't realize the extent of the sort of coercive nature of the therapy itself and I mean, and of the larger community, but the, the larger community was just acting on, you know, the same pressures that were coming through therapy. So for instance, you know, I knew that a lot of kids hadn't been raised by their own parents, um, but I didn't realize the, um, you know, the sort of mechanisms that were at play in the therapy that were convincing mothers to relinquish their children, either to other group members or sending them away to boarding school at such, such a young age. Um, 
and actually, you know, it, it was, uh, my daughter was born right around the time we started this. And it was, a, it was an actual, it was another impetus to start this project because I had this moment of realization that, you know, this, this feeling that I had as a new parent that, you know, nothing I wanted more in the world was than to take care and, you know, protect this, you know, new human. And I couldn't imagine loving her any more than I did. And that there were parents who were in that same, who had those same feelings and they were somehow convinced to give up their children, you know, yeah. to the group in some way. And that realization that what was, you know, going on inside therapy and inside the group itself that was, you know, getting people to believe that this was the right thing to do. That's really sort of was a key turning point. So the discoveries of how those mechanisms work, those mechanisms of control and influence and coercion, that was truly shocking to think that there were all these people around me who were being influenced in this way, um, thinking that this is absolutely the right thing they should be doing. These are the right ways to live. And granted, there were a lot of liberating and idealistic, you know, impetuses and a lot of reasons um, people stayed, you know, other than, you know, this pure coercion. But, you know, when you get into the darker things, there were also abuses that took place, um, which come out more, you know, more clearly in later episodes. And, you know, those as well, how people were being convinced that they should go along with things that they, you know, knew were wrong, essentially, um, that that was that was most shocking. A question for the both of you, but this docu series has been ten years in the making. What's one thing you each know now that you wish you knew when you started this process a decade ago? Uh, we have not been asked that question before. No, no. I mean, I think it's a long. It's been a very long project. The, yeah. the last project I made before this was eleven months, so it's a very different scale. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, you know. Basically, I think the, the the main thing I learned about this project uh, from its l duration was that we would have planned for this thing to be like a one or two year project when we started. We totally were hoping and thinking it would that's what it would be. Um, and obviously, that's not what happened. But what we what we got out of all that time, um, which, again, Keith men mentioned that there's some things you don't see just in the first episode because yeah. it's working things getting set up but when you see everything play out over the next three episodes after this time really becomes an element in this story um and you, there's a passage of time within it that we would never have gotten if it had been a shorter thing and i actually think that's one of the beauties of documentary yeah. in general that is ex really exclusive to documentary and the specific kinds that do take a long time which i don't think anyone ever plans <laughs> for to do many many year long project but the results of that are these very unique and amazing things that can only be captured that way um and i think this is one of those projects that just we happened into a situation where this did take that long and there's a lot that a lot of positive beautiful things that came out of that mm -hmm. yeah, yeah I, I mean that i would say something very similar and just to add that, you know, when we started, we knew that one of the themes we wanted to explore were quite were, had to do with questions of memory and how people mm. look back on this experience, you know, that a lot of cold stories tell the story of just, you know, the history and the crazy things that happen. And they don't look at, you know, what the aftermath is and how these things play out over time and how you live with, you know, the choices you made, the radical choices you made. Yeah when you were younger and how those might affect your relationships and yourself when you're older, you know? And I mean, I, I think it's a great question to ask about societies too, when radical or transgressive things happen within a society, you know, how does that affect, you know, later generations or the people that took part in them? Um, so, you know, we knew that memory in the past and exploration of the past were, were central themes when we started, but if we, we would have maybe felt there would have been less impatience along the way when things were taking longer than we wanted. We would have, you know, had, we would have been a little more relaxed at moments about, oh, it's fine if we can't film this thing right now. We're, there's going to be time. There's going to be mm. room to explore that. 
I have a question for the both of you. The first episode premiered at the Tribeca Film Festival, and it's been incredibly well received. What do you hope each uh, audience's take away after seeing this, and what's next for this docu series? I mean, one of the most amazing things about this, the our screenings at Tribeca, was that because it's a New York story, a lot of the people who are in the story or just connected to it, not in the documentary itself, uh, live in New York or nearby. Yeah. Um, and even some who live far away, but knew a lot of people they they had known would be there, traveled quite a distance. And so the screenings function in some ways as kind of a reunion um, for a lot of people or just a, a chance to kind of come together and around their shared experience. Um, and uh, they were really amazing to just like have those opportunities. And this is, a, you know, it's a series. It doesn't necessarily have a, uh, uh, a life that exists in a in a shared viewing environment it's not it wasn't as a, as a series it's not designed for that so this was a very very special thing to have available to us um <clears throat> it's also just been a, like a nice sort of debut about the project to start talking about it publicly we've we've kept it pretty quiet as we've been working on it over the years um so it's nice to nice to be able to do that um and um, you know what's next is that we are we're in conversations about distribution um, to get the whole four episodes out to people everywhere.